Well, 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 we are back. It is season six of Leading Through Unprecedented Times. I'm Tom Yari, your host, and I can't believe here we are, season six. It has been a long number of years since we kicked off originally, very first season, kicking off two weeks into COVID. It's been four years, and here we are launching season six. You know, when we launched um, season uh, season one, two weeks into COVID, it was really about giving people hope and giving people inspiration. And as, as we fast forward four years, it's really part of the same gig is we want to be able to support people where they're at, give them hope, give them inspiration, tell great stories of amazing things that are happening across the country. And I can't think of a better way to kick off season six, episode one, than my good friend, Superintendent Nick Poliak. Let me tell you a little bit about Nick before I have you do the official introduction. Nick is the superintendent, Layden Community High School District in Illinois, award-winning. He's a dad. He's heavily involved with a great organization, AASA. He runs Soup Chat. He does all sorts of things, an author, speaker. Nick, thanks for the podcast. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Episode one, so no pressure kicking off this season. Nick, how you doing, my friend? Oh, we got this, Tom. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. This is a, a great way to start my day. Awesome. Thank you so much. And listen, I, I started to give just a glimpse into who you are, but for those of you that may not follow your work on social media, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Quick introduction, if you could. Absolutely. Uh, former math teacher back when I started my career, uh, but I've been a superintendent for the past 15 years, all in Illinois. My first district was down in central Illinois, uh, Illinois Valley Central, and I've been here at Leiden for the last 11 years. Um, it's a great, wonderful community. I was, uh, I was telling somebody recently, there's a couple interesting statistics about our school district that I think are maybe relevant to our conversation today. Uh, one is I've been superintendent here for 11 years, but I'm only the fifth superintendent in the school district since 1952. Um, and uh, we've only had two school board presidents in our school community since 1980. So I, I would uh, challenge you to find any school district that can match those statistics. Yeah, Nick, I know pre-COVID, the average superintendent uh, tenure was about three and a half years. I'm not sure if it's been officially weighed, but I know since COVID, it's probably under three years. So those statistics are unheard of. And our superintendent colleagues and friends around the country that just heard those statistics are probably thinking like, he said what? Now, Nick, I have to say, you're, you and your, your team have been on my radar for at least a decade with the incredible things that have been happening um, throughout. And I, I know um, this culture of innovation has been a focus of yours and, and things that are happening, um, you'd be the first to say, I know, aren't just about you as the leader, but I would say you also help lead that and foster this connection and this culture. So talk to us about the culture of innovation that happens in Leiden and, and just some of the great things that are happening there and, and uh, maybe even some historical context over the past decade decade related to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to say everything we talk about today, I, can, I can't claim any responsibility for. The only thing I can say I'm at least partially responsible for is helping to foster this culture of innovation, supporting people to think differently, uh, encouraging them, protecting them, uh, celebrating them. And so, you know, it goes back right when I was transitioning to Leiden, uh, we were known Around, uh, around the country is one of the first three school districts to go one-to-one -one with Chromebooks and with uh, Google Apps. I would say we were Chrome before Chrome was cool. And uh, back then we created this tech support program where we had students running all of our tier one tech support. We called it tech support internship. They would earn credentials and do all the break fix. And over the last decade, we've seen that idea replicated in schools across the country. So I think from the historical perspective, that's what a lot of people knew Leiden for back in the, you know, you know, 2010, 11, 12 time frame. Yeah, I love that. You know, we think about the future ready framework, the outside piece is that uh, collaborative leadership and inclusive culture and creating cultures where people want to be. You know, when I was pulling up your bio to help kick off this session, I noticed in one of the sections it mentioned that Leiden's been um, named the one of the top places to work. There you are, a suburb of, or you're out, you know, outside of Chicago there and being named one of the top places to work at a time where when you look on social media and it feels like the sky is falling and some folks, everything is terrible and all this. And and yet you're creating these incredible cultures where people want to be. So as a leader, what, what advice do you have for folks? Maybe I'm taking over a new building as a principal, or maybe there's a new superintendent coming up. 
how do we work to create that culture? And, you know, you mentioned the, the changeover and how few, how few it's been. I mean, two board presidents since 1980, literally unheard of, I agree. But there's also some components of, of trust that we talked about a little bit earlier pre-show. And so I'd love for you to connect a little bit with creating cultures where people want to be and, and trust. And, and what advice do you have for leaders in fostering those things? Yeah, I think continuity is, is really important. When you work together, you know, from my lens, a superintendent and school board members, we've been together for 11 years. There's a great amount of trust between us built up. And so if I bring some crazy ideas to them, there's a pretty good chance they're going to give me, give me a chance to, to try it. I might not have been able to bring that in year one or year two. And so when you're constantly moving and changing, you never get to build up the trust in order to get inertia for, for positive things to happen in the school district. And so it, as much as I can lean on the trust between the school board and I from, from my seat, I need to extend that trust to all the people in the organization so that they know I'm going to support them. I'm going to help them with the things they're trying to do for our students. And if, if I don't create that culture, the good things aren't going to happen because collectively we have amazing ideas, but if I'm trying to be the only creator of ideas, nothing good is ever going to happen. Right? I've never had a good idea in my life, but I can support people who have good ideas. And then that just kind of echoes through the school district. Yeah. You know, Nick, from the outside looking in and getting to work with a lot of school and district leaders around the country, one of your first statements to me really jumped out where you talked about how, you know, it's not about you, the great things that have happened. It's about your people. And I think great leaders like yourself um, you know, kind of give more credit than is due and probably take more blame at times than is due, as, as often is said. But your ability to, to, to show humility and also build up other people around you is certainly foundational to that culture. You know, one of the things I want to dive into a little bit, you, you, you shared how, you know, being one of the first three districts to go one to one with Chromebooks back then. Um, let's talk about technology a little bit. Fast forward all these years and we've got, you know, we've got AI, we've got all this technology and all these components out there. What does technology look like at your high school? on a day-to-day -day from a teaching and learning end, you know, how is it maybe opening access or opportunities? Part of the reason I ask is we lead National Digital Learning Day, which we had back in February. You know, it was the, I believe, the 13th Digital Learning Day this past year. We celebrated the 14th one, you know, next year. And it's really become the celebration of great practices that are happening across the country. It is not by any means, let's just go digital on this one day. It's much more celebrating how technology can open up opportunities for kids. So, you know, you, you've been recognized as this innovative uh, district for a decade, over a decade now. What does it look like today if we fast forward, just some of the practices, some of the ways technology is supporting teaching and learning? Um, I would like to think, and this is going to sound cliche, that the technology in the classrooms has become ubiquitous. This is just how we do business, right? It's just kind of embedded throughout. Where I see the excitement is the way we're leveraging technology, modern tools to, to help kids uh, gain experiences to be ready for the work world and to be ready for the world world. Uh, so if you look at our, I, I'll always tout our business department at being super creative and flexible. You know, back when we created Tech Support Internship, you know, they didn't know how to fix Chromebooks. They didn't know how to, you know, do these things. They said, we're just going to learn alongside the kids. So a decade later, what does that look like? Well, now they're teaching cybersecurity. They're teaching advanced video game design. They're running our esports program where kids are winning state championships here. And so our people being flexible enough to say, I can't wait to learn all the new things. We just need to create the courses and learn alongside the kids to get them ready for the world. That's that's where I get excited. Yeah, going back to the student voice component earlier as well, I think that's such an important part of that. You know, I think so many times we try to create things for students without having, without even asking them, right? Like we're we're designing things without asking what they actually want, but the relevance and the things that you're talking about, the connections to the world of work. Um, one of the things that I know you're passionate about is student voice. And so kind of moving from technology to just focusing on the kid, what are some ways at, at your high school that, that, you, that you leverage that student voice? You know, and I think sometimes we talk about like, We've got to give them a voice. And I'll say, like, they have a voice. It's how do we amplify it? How do we take into consideration? How does it support our decision making? So what's that look like in your in your high school district? Well, first of all, my friends, Mike Lubelfeld, PJ Capozzi, and I wrote a book called Student Voice uh, from Invisible to Invaluable. And I want to personally thank you, Tom, for having them both on the podcast before me. That uh, that warms my heart, just so you know. 
and I'll tell them if because I'm sure they're listening to this that we're going to save the best for last for uh, for that. So no kudos to three of you. And I want to ask you about your most recent book there as well. But tell us a little about the, the student voice component. Yeah. And what that looks like. And a shout out to PJ and Mike Lubefeld as well. Two great leaders. No, you know, we tell people all the time, nobody built these buildings. Nobody created these school districts so that adults have a place to go. The sole purpose we're here, the sole reason we have jobs is to support kids and to help them with the best possible outcomes. And so one of the things we did at Leiden about seven years ago is we told our Board of Education, if that's really what we're about, let's give students a seat at the table. And so we started putting student board members in place. So in Illinois, we have seven elected adults that serve as the Board of Education. At Leiden, we have nine. Every year, there's a student from each of our two high schools who sits at the board table. They receive the board packet. They go to the state conference with us. They're there to represent the student constituency in the same way that the adults represent the neighborhoods they live in. And so we, we turn it over to the kids. You're part of the leadership team along with everybody else. Yeah, and they'll keep you brutally honest too, right? If we say, oh, here's what we're doing, then they start looking at you being like, uh, I've never heard of that, right? And and that's part of the power of having them there is they're going to keep you honest. And from board member end, let's be real. I mean, I, I kudos to your board and the, the just the connectivity throughout the years. But, you know, I think board members probably, um, probably might respond to things a little bit differently when they've got a, a great student sitting next to them in those pieces. You know, we, we talked about technology and in 2024, it is so easy for us to jump to the tech and the AI and all those pieces. But the value that you put place, just like my home district where I live in Pennsylvania, on the arts as well, I think is just awesome because that's, I think, gotten lost in certain places or devalued in certain places. But when you're talking about student voice, talking about creating cultures of empowerment, cultures of, of innovation where people want to be, they come to you and ask questions. And tell us a little about, um, I understand that your, your theater department is just rocking it today. And some of the other things from the arts end that might have nothing to do with technology or not be front and center. Um, tell us a little bit about that and some of the things you have going on there. Yeah, innovation's everywhere, right? It, it can be anything. And so a uh, number of years ago, well, I guess if you go way back in the 70s, Leiden was a predominantly Italian community. And you see culture shifts over the years. And fast forward to today, we're um, nearly 80% Hispanic in our school district. And our theater department um, realized that our Hispanic students were not represented in theater. Maybe they weren't enjoying, you know, performing in Oklahoma. And so they said, can we try something different? And they created what is now Teatro Leiden, where every year we pick a show and we cast it twice with an English speaking cast and a Spanish speaking cast. And you can come on Friday and see it in English, come on Saturday and see it in Spanish. We've got bilingual students working as producers and as crossover performers in both shows. It's been transformative, Tom, to see different groups of parents showing up here, to see different restaurants and stores in the community putting up posters to celebrate the theater. Um, and it was one little decision made by our theater department who was willing to innovate and just change to meet the kids. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And part of what I love about that story and sharing that is somebody looked at it and said, something's not right here. When you look at the overall demographics and then you look at the demographics of what was and saying, this isn't matching. And so we could go beyond, and I think lessons here from, from any district end, we could look at it and just say, well, I guess they're just not interested. Or we could look at it and saying, why aren't they part of this? And I think that's part of whether we're walking into an AP class being like, you know, you mentioned cybersecurity, you walk into the average cybersecurity AP class in, in, our, in our country, and it's shifting a little bit, fortunately, because of intentional leaders like you, but traditionally it's been folks that look like you and I, Nick, right? And so when we look at that being intentional and saying like, why is the vast majority of our population, our Hispanic students not signing up? say, let's do it differently and talk about thriving. And I have to be honest, I haven't heard, and th there may be others out there. I haven't heard of another high school district or any, any district doing exactly what you just shared, but what a way to celebrate culture, but to also just celebrate the, the togetherness and the inclusivity there. That's such a powerful story for that. Um, and kudos to your board as well, because another thing that I've seen that you do each year is around some of these like, global services trips. And, and again, talking about um, the, your population that you serve, giving opportunities and access. Tell us a little about what that looks like, how your board supports it, maybe a recent trip and, and kind of why you do it. Yeah. As a school district, we feel very strongly about service, that we want to produce students that are highly achieving academic, but also understand their place in the world and that we all have an opportunity to give back. And so we do that a lot in the community level and the state level. 
And we wanted to create these global service opportunities for kids to, you know, go to another country to give back to support communities there. But uh, our student population is not the most affluent. And so we were worried that if we created those opportunities, but not many kids could afford to do it, we didn't really create anything. And so we said to the board, if we believe in this, let's put our resources, put our money where our mouth is. And so we created these programs. So now annually, our board puts up a quarter million dollars to defray the cost of kids to go serve globally. So every kid that wants to go, they get charged $500 to go to Mexico, where they can work at orphanages and rural schools to support kids. Uh, last summer, kids went to the Dominican Republic and they were doing uh, coral reef repairs um, and understanding the aquatic, you know, how to, how to take care of the ocean and, and the beach lines. Uh, when we do this, those kids come back and we bring them to a school board meeting and they tell the story of what they did. The parents in the audience stand up and say, you brought back a different kid than I sent with you on that trip. And the parents cry and the board members cry. And that's when I get my contract renewed and the whole thing comes <laughs> together. Just, but no, it, it's, so, it's so cool to see the board use our resources in a way that's developing kids with a global mindset. Right. It's just it, it's fun to see. Yeah, I have chills as you're sharing that. Just, you know, recognizing how many times folks like that. And when you think about the students that you serve, how many of them would have that opportunity, certainly before high school to do anything like that, if the district didn't create the access and the opportunities to be able to do that and then help fund that trip, to, uh, tremendously help fund that trip is just massive. And I love that. I mean, any any person that's been a part of something like that knows you really do come home with a different perspective on life and probably appreciating certain things that we have that maybe we've just always taken for granted. But I love that servant heart, that service mindset. It's really helped creating these cultures of empathy as well and just uh, and togetherness. What an incredible opportunity. Um, now, Layden's also, and one of the things that I love about your district is that people come to visit all the time, right? And then they're coming because there's great things happening and you've shared some some awesome things happening already. Um, I know you also do this this really cool collab, I believe it's called, piece that I've kind of seen celebrate on social media a little bit. Tell us about that. Or or if I'm somebody that's saying, hey, I want to go visit, what, that might be one thing. What are, what are some neat things that are happening? I mean, you've shared some already, but what, what tell me about collab and maybe anything else you want to celebrate just uh, might be a little bit different or unique that other districts can learn from. Yeah, thank you. Collab is a great example of a culture of innovation, supporting teachers. We, we took a group of teachers a number of years ago and we called them the innovation incubator. We gave them some release time from, uh, from meetings and said, dream big. What would you like to do if, if you could do anything? And so they started uh, you know, researching and looking and, and iterating. And what they eventually came up with was what became CoLab, which is um, easily explained as a school within a school. And so our freshmen can opt into this program where it's interdisciplinary. They earn their credits for science, English, social studies, PE, health, and digital literacy, all in one big time block. So there's no bells. It's all, you know, you, you've got this big time. You can hop on a bus and go take some water samples at, you know, at a local river and then come back and study them. And then your writing prompt is about what you learn from that. And it's all woven together. Um, and so, you know, I've seen this in a lot of places, versions of something like this. I've never seen a big comprehensive high school embedded in their day the way our teachers have. And so a lot of folks are traveling here right now to see CoLab. You know, open invitation to any of your listeners if they want to reach out to me. We're always welcoming guests because our kids are proud to tell you what they're out doing in the community, how they're giving back through their program. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. And appreciate that invitation. I got to tell you, there's probably some folks listening being like, um, I'm also going to take a look at the applications from the things that I'm hearing here for, uh, for what's available there. This is, I know for me, you know, when I hear about these kinds of things and I work for an incredible visionary leader as well, that'll, that created cultures of innovation that, that allowed us to ask questions of, Hey, can we try this? And instead of asking why it was, why not? Right. And I think that, uh, we're seeing so much of that here as well. I do want to give you a shout out to, I know that you all, uh, you and Mike and PJ just released another book called the unfinished teacher connects to the unfinished leader, which you had written. 
Um, so for those folks that are listening here and you're hearing about the innovation, you're hearing about the culture stuff, tell us a little bit about, I know the unfinished leader came first and then the unfinished teacher kind of tied to that. Give us the, the little bit of an elevator pitch between the two, because I also know that they connect and uh, and kudos as an author myself, I know that the labor of love that is. And so, um, so tell us a little bit about those. Um, here's the elevator pitch. A lot of times people talk about trying to be the best version of themselves. We are offering and trying to free you from that to say, you know what, knock it off. There's no such thing. There is no best version of you. There's only the next version of you. Hmm. We individually, our schools, our districts are in this constant iterative process. And if you can lean into that, it's very freeing. And then you start to ask yourself, what do I need to learn next? What do I need to do next? And so for the unfinished teacher, if you think about um, going back to the, the college programs we went to to prepare us to be teachers and the work that we do today, they don't align at all, right? And so it maybe it gave us the certification, but the learning happens throughout. And so just we're trying to help folks be comfortable in being unfinished and seeing that as a good thing as opposed to a bad thing. Oof, love that. Absolutely. And a time for it as well. I want to ask you besides how to connect or how to follow your work or, or, or get connected, that's where I'll end. But I want to ask you one more piece. Maybe I'm a superintendent listening to this. I'm in a first year in my district and, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, my board continues to turn over like crazy. Everything seems politics here and there and all this craziness. And they're looking at you feeling like, oh, I would just love to get there. These cultures of innovation, I would love to build trust. What piece of advice do you have at this point in the year, you know, number of months left before we start wrapping down and start thinking about next year? What piece of advice do you have for school and district leaders around the country to help build what it is that they want to be able to build for kids? Give us some advice. That's a super easy prompt. Thank you, Tom. Piece of cake, right? <laughs> um, I think... Um, as I reflect, one of the things I've learned over the years is that we're a high school district. Our students turn over every four years. Administrators tend to be looking for growth opportunities. So if you're a dean, maybe you want to be an assistant principal. If you're a principal, you want to be an assistant superintendent. And so there's a lot of change that happens in the students and in the administrators. But the teachers and the support staff are the true through line of the organization. Oftentimes, they're there for 20, 30, 40 years in their roles. And so the amount that we can invest in them and support them to be part of that innovative mindset, that's where the real gains are going to be. If it's going to come through the administrators, we change too often, right? We need to make sure we empower the kids, but you got to take care of your people because that's, that's the lifeblood of the place. Oh, Nick, there is no better place to wrap up than taking care of your people. I uh, respect you tremendously as a friend and as a leader and just the, the work that you've led for the past decade, the things that are happening in your district. So just one final question as I gave away earlier, if folks want to connect with you on social media or follow your work, what's the best way to do that? Sure. Pretty easy to find. If you want to go on Twitter or X, I'm at N Poliak, P-O-L-Y-A-K, or you can just find me on the website and shoot me an email. Pretty, pretty easy to find and pretty accessible. Awesome. I appreciate you, my man. Thanks for tuning in. The very first episode of season six. I can't think of a better way to give us some hope, some inspiration, push us a little bit as well. Nick, thanks for being here today. Of course, Tom, I'm honored to be here. Thanks for having me.